Harris in a salute to the law. Crime never fails. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the message of the Nick Harris program. That is the purpose of these weekly true-to-life dramatizations. To prove that crime never pays. Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Tong, and good evening, everyone. We have been talking a great deal on these programs about the prevention of crime. Tonight's dramatization illustrates a frequent cause of crimes of violence, a desire for revenge, the determination to take the law into one's own hands in an attempt to right some real or fancied wrong. The story I'm about to relate took place some 30 years ago, right here in Los Angeles. All was peaceful that July night in the old police headquarters at Thurston Hill. I was a cub reporter on the Daily Journal. Death Sergeant McClure was on duty. Only midnight, Sergeant. Lacking one minute. Don't you ever forget to wind that old clock? I'll have you know that I'm the final timekeeper of the side of Chicago. Yes, unless you forget to wind it. That I do not never. Never? Well, uh, that will hold you for another day. You know, Mac, someday we'll have clocks run by electricity. Electricity? Uh, sure. Why not? Clocks run by electricity. <laughs> and horseless carriages, too. And airships to fly and be light. And telephones without no wires. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't, huh? Well, they do say nothing never uh, surprises a newspaper reporter. I know one thing that would. What's that, Nicholas? A story. A real front-page story. A murder, say. What's a murder you'll be wanting this night? Well, it doesn't have to be a murder, Mac, but I sure wish something would happen. Things have been a bit quiet around here lately, and that's a fact. Quiet? Say, compared to this place, our Quaker meeting is a madhouse. The police phone, Mac. Maybe that's something. McClure on the desk. Yeah, Murphy. They're shooting. Huh. Whereabouts? Well, who are you? The indicator shows he's calling from first and spring. Oh, to be sure, Murphy. I'll have the wagon there directly. Hey, Klein. Uh, yes, Max. What do you want? Uh, get the uh, Rico and uh, the patrol wagon down to first and spring as fast as you can. There's been a shooting scrape, and Murphy wants some help. <laughs> All right, Jimmy, this is a stretcher case. Okay, I'll bring it in. Well, come on, where's the victim? Third floor, back this way and up these stairs. Follow me. Hey there, where do you think you're going? Oh, nowhere, officer. I was just coming down to see if I could be of any help. Yeah, well, get back up them stairs and be quick about it. Okay. I said nobody was to leave the third floor till I gave you permission. All right, officer, all right. What's your name? Pickens is my name, Robert Pickens. Uh, stick around, Pickens, and don't try to make a getaway. Why, certainly not. I was merely going to volunteer my services. All right, stay here. Yes, sir. In here. Over this way. Get back, you. Here in this corner, on the floor. Put the stretcher alongside you. Looks bad, all right. Gosh, yes. Eyes glowed white as a sheep. Oh, he's lost a lot of blood already. What's the boy's name, Murphy? Atwood, he said. Donald Atwood. All the rest of these guys here when the shooting took place? Guess so, Jimmy, but none of them will admit seeing it. Well, get Atwood to the receiving hospital. Take Pickens with you and hold him. I'll herd the rest of these guys over to the station later. What do you think, Doc? Well, I have to pull the bullet right now. It's going to hurt like Sam Atwood. There's no other way. All right, Doc. You have to. You have to. Uh, hold on, Doc. Has the boy made any statements? No, but he's in no condition to make one now. Unless I get that bullet out right away. Oh, Henry. What'd you say, Doctor? Lie back, Atwood. Don't try to sit up. Lie back, man. Am I going to die? Tell me. No, no. Not if you lie back and take it easy. Yes, I am. I'm going to die. I can feel it. The lights. They're getting dim. Look, my sister. Yes? What about her? Will you tell her something for me? Sure, Atwood. What is it? Tell her I did it for her. 
I don't understand. But is she in Los Angeles? Yes. Well, what's her address? Do both me. Do one. Oh, a quick doctor. Oh, Sergeant. Donald Atwood in there? Let me in. I've got to see Donald Atwood. Who are you and what do you want? I want to see Atwood. They said he was in here. Where is he? There. Oh, he's dead. Oh, well, excuse me, will you? You see, I... Well, goodbye. Well, then, who might he be? I don't know, but I'm going to follow him and find out. I'll go with you, Nick. Over there. Isn't that the cab we were chasing? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Looks like it. Let's go over and question the driver. All right, fine. Hey, cabby. Where's your fare? Hey, he's in that house. Tell me to wait. Uh, who is he? I don't know. A guy by the name of Ramey. Now, come on, Harris. Who is it? Police. Open up. What do you want? I'm just leaving. And where do you think you're going, Mr. Ramey? I'm going to find the man that killed Don Atwood. You know who killed him? You there when he was shot? No. I was asleep when the boy brought the message. Don had been shot in Senfield's gambling house. The boy didn't know who did it, but I do. Pickens did it. Pickens? Yes, Robert Pickens, Don's brother-in-law. Don told me he was looking for Pickens. He must have caught up with him in Senfield. Hmm, Atwood wanted us to take a message to his sister. Said that he'd done it for her. But before we could give us, before she could give us her address, he died. You know what, Ramey? No, not the number. But I can take you there. Not now, though. I've got to find Pickens first. Well, Pickens is at headquarters. And he'll not be leaving until we've had plenty of time to question him. All right, then. Let's go. Sure, this is the place, Ramey? Yes, I'm sure it is. Number 214, Klein. That's the number that Atwood was trying to tell us. Yeah? Okay, I'll try the skeleton key. Good, it's open. Huh. Maybe she's flown the coop. No, I don't think so. Two suitcases in this closet, and dresses hanging on the hook. She might be working. I remember now. Don told me Laura had been working as a waitress in an all night restaurant on Spring Street. Suppose I go see. Okay. If you find her, bring her back here. If you don't, come back anyhow and let us know. We'll be waiting. Right. I'll be back as quick as I can. Well, looks like we're in for the wait. Play pitch, Harris? A little. Yes. I got my card. There might be a deck here, though. Sure, here's one. Now, clear that stuff off the table. All right. Full deck? I'm just counting to see. 40, 44, 48, 51. Short a card. Oh, well, we can use it anyhow. We know which card's missing. I'll sort them. Spade, heart, spade, club, spade, diamond, club. Ace of spades missing. Uh, we'll make the tray the ace. <laughs> Remember now, Harris. Tray of spades is the ace of spades. All right. Chuffle them. Go ahead. Deal. Hi, low jack and game. <laughs> like taking candy from a baby. What kind of pitch playing is that, Harris? Why don't you pay attention to the cards? Oh, sorry, Jimmy. I can't seem to get my mind on it. Listen. Somebody's coming, all right. Hey, what you putting those cards in your pocket for? Just in case I get stuck out alone with you again sometime, Jimmy. Laura, this is Detective Klein of the police and Mr. Harris of the journal. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Harris? Uh, pleased to meet you, Mrs. Pickens. I suppose Mr. Ramey has told you. No, I haven't told Laura anything yet except, except that you wanted to talk to her. Oh, well, uh, you see, Mrs. Pickens... What is it? Has something happened to my husband? Uh, no... Not yet. Well, enough. tell me. Please tell me. I hate to be the one, but uh, well, your brother's been shot. Oh. Oh, how terrible. Where is he? Take me to him. I would, Mrs. Pickens, gladly. Only it's too late. Not his... dead? Yes, Laura. Oh. <laughs> but what happened? Who did it? We don't know yet, Mrs. Pickens. Oh. But if there's any help you could give the police... No, certain... no. It will all come out sooner or later, Laura. Wouldn't it be better to <laughs> tell the whole truth now? no. Oh, all right. I'll tell. Five years ago, back in a little town in Ohio, I met Robert Pickens. I fell in love with him. My family objected strongly. I should have listened to them, of course, but I didn't. We eloped across the state line into Indiana. We took me to Denver and Butte, and about two years ago to Los Angeles. Things went badly when my husband, 
Well, for a year now, off and on, we've lived in what I could earn as a waitress. I hadn't written my family for years, and I thought and hoped they'd forgotten about me until about three weeks ago when my brother Don walked in on me unexpectedly. He wanted me to go back home with him. I refused. I was part of the anger. I thought Don had gone back east. But last night, just before time for me to go to work, I go on duty at 7, John came here. Listen, Laura, you've simply got to go back with me. I can't, Don. I couldn't do it. I'm not going, and that's final. All right. I didn't want to tell you this, Laura, but it seems I have to. I have been checking up on the husband you've been supporting, and I find he's spending a lot of his time with another woman. Oh, no. Yes, Laura, and that's not the worst. This afternoon, I followed them into a cafe in Chinatown with curtained off tables. I slipped into the booth next to theirs, and this is what I heard. Well, do we or don't we slip off for Frisco tomorrow night, Effie? No, Bob, we don't. But then you mean you, you didn't mean it when you said you loved me? Of course I did, Bob. You know I did. Oh, but you see, dear... Well, I've done plenty that I wouldn't want to tell my mother. But there's one thing I won't do, Bob. And that's come between a husband and his wife. Oh, but Laura's not my wife. She's not? No. <laughs> she thinks she is. I never told her the ceremony was a phony. Laura's got no legal claim on me, Effie. Not a shadow of a claim. Well, then in that case, Frisco, tomorrow night. But in spite of all he had told me, I still refuse to go back home with Don. He swore he'd make Robert go to another ceremony with me so that we would really be married. Well, I knew that wasn't necessary. We were married. Robert was lying to that woman. And I begged John to forget the whole thing, not to worry about me anymore. And when he left here, I thought he was going to. But evidently... I see. Well, thank you, Mrs. Pickens, for telling us. You haven't a thing to worry about. Well, come on, Harris. Uh, you'd better come along, too, Ramey. Uh, good night, sir. Well, what do you make of it, Murphy? Neither head nor tail, huh? I thought so. I'd like to get my hands on him, but I won't start anything. Yeah, better not. Uh, have Pickens brought in. I want to talk to that fellow. You sound pretty sure it was Pickens, Jimmy? Dead sure, Mac. But I don't know how I'm going to prove it. Then go ahead. I'll have Pickens here in a minute. Come clean, Pickens. Four witnesses say you and Atwood were alone at that table when the shooting took place. All right. I did shoot Atwood. I had to, in, in self-defense. We were playing studs, see? And, well, Atwood rung in a phony cot on me. When I caught him at it, he pulled a gun. That's a lie. Don never did a dishonest thing in his life. Easy there, Ramey. What became of this phony card, Pickens? Well, Atwood put it back in his pocket when he reached for his gun. Yeah, if it's there, you planted it on him. Hey, oh, Klein. Yes, Harris, what is it? Look, Klein, there is a card in Atwood's pocket. Look at the back of it, and then take a look at the back of the deck we were playing pitch with in Pickens' flat. Pickens owns deck. I just see him, all right. Remember this deck was one card short? The ace of spades? Yes. What card is that piece of from Atwood's pocket? Well, what card is it? Turn it over, Harris, so I can see it. The ace of spades. <laughs> The Ace of Spades. Yes, Mr. Tong. An unlucky card for Mr. Robert Pickens. He paid the bitter penalty for murder. But Don Atwood might be still alive today had he not tried to take the law into his own hands, as proven to you in this true life story I have entitled The Fatal Ace of Spades. And thank you, Mr. Russell. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard another true life story brought to you by Detective Nicholas B. Harris internationally famous Los Angeles criminologist and chief of detective agency bearing his name. Although this was a true story, fictitious names and places have been used throughout this narrative. The story was dramatized by Ralph Brookhart, directed and produced by Carolyn Carroll. Mr. Harris wishes me to thank you, following cast, for their participation in this broadcast. Betty Carmine, Olive Thomas, Jack Coster, Thomas Melba... Eddie Ryan, Malcolm Belairs, Robert Moore, Aldine Brenneman, and George Conkling, and Eric Lawrence. Mr. Harris will again be heard over this same station next Friday evening at 8.45 in another interesting crime story entitled Drops of Blood, and which will prove to the youth of today the folly of committing crime. Mm -hmm.